Good morning. I'm glad everybody got a seat. I'm Council Member Margaret Chin, Chair of the Committee on Aging, the Department for the Aging, or DIFTA, served nearly 30 DC senior center sites. These senior centers to older adults, including meals, health management, resources, programming, and socialization. According to the National Council on Seniors, who attend seniors experience improvement in their social, mental, and economic well-being. Study also shows that seniors who attend senior centers learn to manage and even postpone the beginning of chronic illness. With such benefits, it is vital that our senior centers are financially equipped to support their older adult participants. Sadly, senior centers receive different amount of funding and are reimbursed at different rates. Though the reason why is often unclear. Recognizing such funding disparities among senior centers, the council successfully negotiated with the administration to add 10 million to the baseline budget to put toward right-sizing senior center budgets. Beginning in FY, 2018. DIFTA and the Office of Management and Budget, or OMB, work together to create a model budget for senior centers. Both agencies decided to focus the model budget process on ensuring that providers have adequate funding to support programming and direct staff. Absent from such model budget, however, was funding for meals meals preparation, and kitchen staff. Last year, the Council Aging Committee held an oversight hearing on DIFTA Senior Center model budget, where the committee raised concern about DIFTA's model budget, model senior center budget. Unfortunately, many of the issues we raised at the hearing remain, including the administration's failure to address food in the model budget process. Food and meals are major drivers of expense and very quickly between providers. In order to put such discrepancy into perspective, I would like to share data from a 2018 state controller Thomas DiNapoli's um, report. According to the report, while 37 senior centers were provided between $3 to $6 per congregate meal. 108 were provided between $6 to $9 per congregate meal. 71 were provided between $9 to $12 per congregate meal. And 30 were funded for $12 for more per congregate meal. These are huge gaps. And as I stated many times, before, such gaps should have been addressed during the first phase of the model budget process. I'm also alarmed that the model budget did not address kitchen staff who work diligently to ensure that our seniors have meals. Furthermore, the administration is adding fuel to the fire by dragging their feet on the implementation of the model food budget process. At a March 2018 Aging Committee hearing, then DIFTA Commissioner Donna Corrado testified before the committee that DIFTA and a consultant, Guy House, were analyzing food service meal reimbursement and how the administration could modernize food services. The former commissioner also testified that the food service component and reimbursement for meal should be addressed in phase two of the model budget process. Later, at a June 2018 Aging Committee hearing, DIFTA testified that phase two of the model budget process would be completed by December 2018. 
It is now February 27th, and neither DIFTA nor OMB have released any information on the model food budget analysis. This is unacceptable. Without immediate action, we cannot begin a process to provide desperately needed support to senior center kitchen staff workers who have been left out of the model budget process and deserve a living wage. Many senior centers and service providers have shared stories that attest to the critical role that kitchen staff play in their center's success and their seniors' health and well-being. Many kitchen staff often have to balance several hats, serving as not only the cook, but also the food delivery driver and even dishwasher. One kitchen service manager at a senior center in Midtown oversee more than 4,700 meals a week. As one Brown Center, center put, put it, they work hard to serve our community member in a safe and efficient manner. They are worthy of a living wage. A model budget process that excludes this core need is not a model budget at all. At today's hearing, the committee seeks to hear, especially when the second phase of the model budget process will be completed. The committee also seek to learn more about the model budget food process and uh, learn more about the model food budget analysis and process, especially the process DIFTA has made, uh, what data and information they have discovered during the analysis, if any, and how they have involved advocates in such process. I would like to thank the committee staff for helping in putting together this hearing. Our policy analyst, Kalima Johnson, uh, Council Nusa Chadari, and finance analyst, Daniel Krupp, and finance unit head, Do Dohini Sapura, and my legislative director, Marion Guerra. And I'd like to thank the other committee, uh, the other member of the committee who have joined us today. We have Council Member Drum, Council Member Valong, and Council Member Eugene. Um, right now, I am going to ask the council staff to uh, administer the oath uh, to the uh, panel from the administration. <clears throat> Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Good morning, Chairperson Chin and members of the Aging Committee. I'm Karen Resnick, Acting Commissioner for the New York City Department for the Aging. I'm joined today by Michael Bosnick, Deputy Commissioner for the Division of Planning and Technology. I'd like to thank you for this opportunity to provide testimony on the topic of Senior Center Model Food Budgets. We're grateful for the Administration's partnership with the Council, championed by your leadership and advocacy, Councilwoman Chin. This collaboration has led to an increase in DIFTA's annual funding by more than $90 million, representing 60% growth in the agency's city tax levy baseline budget. As a result of this investment, we implemented senior center model budgets with an additional $10 million in new baseline funds beginning in FY18 for the DIFTA portfolio. We stabilized case management staffing through an infusion of $7.3 million to provide more competitive salaries, which have helped reduce high turnover rates, improved service delivery, and ensured continuity and quality of care. We've doubled DIFTA's existing allocation to $8 million for caregiver programs to provide more support to caregivers and care receivers with the cre creativity and flexibility they need to address these services. We expanded multidisciplinary teams comprised of professionals from adult protective services, law enforcement, medical centers, financial institutions, and community-based organizations through a $1.5 million increase in baseline funding. These teams were established in all five boroughs, strengthening the city's ability to address complex elder abuse cases in a coordinated fashion. 
and we committed an additional $3.2 million increase in DIFTA's baseline budget to focus on geriatric mental health as part of the suite of groundbreaking initiatives under Thrive NYC, including one program that embeds mental health practitioners in senior centers across the city, and another program that combats social isolation among homebound older adults. As the largest area agency on aging in the nation, DIFTA currently funds senior centers at 249 sites across the five boroughs at approximately $150 million annually, serving about 173,000 older New Yorkers in FY18. Senior centers provide meals at no cost to seniors, though modest contributions are accepted and are completely voluntary, and an environment where older New Yorkers can participate in a variety of recreational, health promotional, and cultural activities, as well as receive counseling on social services and obtain assistance with benefits. Each day, 25,000 older adults receive meals at senior centers, and another 5,000 participate in activities without taking a meal. All DIFTA-sponsored senior centers serve food that meets city and state nutritional standards, and meals that are culturally relevant to program participants are available citywide. The majority of senior centers cook on site. Some programs caters, cater, and other centers prepare meals for other programs. Kosher meal programs are available at senior centers in all five boroughs. A number of senior centers in Brooklyn, Manhattan, and Queens serve meals that are culturally appropriate to their Chinese constituents, including senior centers in Chairperson Chin's district. In Queens, Korean Community Services of Metropolitan New York provides Korean meals at the DIFTA Senior Center they operate in Flushing in Councilmember Vallone's district, as well as at another site in Corona. In the Bronx, several senior centers serve Spanish and Latin American fare as the preference of their constituents. Other senior centers offer Indian, Italian, Southern, and Caribbean meals to meet constituents' needs. Through cultural sharing and exchanges enriched by educational programming and translation services, senior centers foster sensitivity and appreciation for different cultures among a diverse membership which break down cultural barriers and centers that have undergone demographic changes. DIFTA engaged Fordham University to conduct an analysis of the impact of participation in senior center activities on the overall health and well-being of older New Yorkers. The study followed older adults who were participants in senior centers, as well as older adults who had not participated in a senior center for at least one year. Findings indicated that senior center members are achieving positive outcomes. Senior center participants reported improved physical and mental health, increased participation in health programs, frequent exercising, and positive behavior change in monitoring weight and keeping physically active. Participation in a senior center also helped to reduce social isolation. The older adult population served by senior centers are among those with the lowest incomes, the fewest resources, the poorest health, the greatest social isolation, and the most need for services. The findings of this study indicate that senior centers are attracting this group that has multiple needs, and senior center members experience improved physical and mental health, not only in the time period after joining a senior center, but maintain or even continue to improve even one year later. This is a very important finding given the decline in health and social activity in this age group, especially among those with low incomes. Maintenance of health and social activity rather than a decline is a major benefit of senior centers. In June 2018, DIFTA discussed the senior center model budget process before this committee. We stated that the overarching goal of the initiative is twofold, to increase resources to ensure strong programming across the network of 249 senior centers, and to increase equity among centers by making more uniform the level of financial support provided to each of them. In line with the broader vision of promoting fairness and equity, the administration added $10 million in new baseline funds for the senior center portfolio starting in FY18. This significant investment in the DIFTA network was designed to help create parity in our senior center budgets and provide adequate funding to achieve an expanded array of programming 
across the senior center system. DIFTA and the Mayor's Office of Management and Budget, with input from our network providers and other stakeholders, conducted a thorough analysis of the existing line item budgets and spending patterns across our portfolio of 249 senior centers. As a result, we identified several characteristics that exemplify high quality programs, highlighting strong leadership and staff, as well as a rich array of health and education programming. We then compared existing budgets to the funding patterns that support the key attributes of high quality programs and calculated the need for each center based on where their current budgets compare to the model. The model budget reflects that every center needs adequate funding to provide threshold levels of quality programming and to pay competitive wages to attract and retain high quality staff. The network of 249 senior centers was divided into five groups based on average daily participants in recognition of the fact that there are certain costs that vary based on the size of a center, such as the need for modestly more staff to run a very large center compared to a very small one. At the same time, the model accounts for certain fixed costs for running a center, irrespective of ad average daily participants. The resulting amounts given to each center were divided between an amount for program staff and another for programming based on each center's areas of need. However, funding remained flexible across line items within certain parameters, thus allowing centers to identify their most critical needs and submit proposals accordingly. We are pleased to report that a large number of providers have told us that the infusion of funding given to them has made a marked difference in the levels, types, and quality of programming they can offer. Various centers have used the funds to right-size salaries and bring on board one or more new staff members to expand and enrich programming. At this time, we're engaged in the second and final phase of the model budget process centered on food and related staff costs. DIFTA is working with sta stakeholders and with OMB to determine the amount of funding needed for food purchase and for adequate members of food staff receiving competitive salaries in order to provide high quality meals with cultural diversity throughout the Senior Center network. Though their major focus is on home delivered meals, we've also engaged GuideHouse, formerly PricewaterhouseCoopers, public sector practice, to provide additional support to DIFTA and OMB's analysis. I would like to summarize the progress to date. DIFTA has been taking, seeking stakeholder input concerning food and food costs and held a focus group with providers this past January. We've received invaluable information and insights from umbrella organizations involved in aging services, as well as seniors who attend senior centers. According to the focus group discussion, senior centers take pride in their ability to deliver quality, diverse food. New York City has one of the most diverse populations in the country, as well as some of the highest food prices nationally. These programs help older New Yorkers stay engaged in their communities and offer a place where they feel at home. In relation to food service, centers also face challenges related to staffing, facilities, menu planning, and reporting. We've worked with GuideHouse to collect information concerning food and related staff costs, efficiencies, innovations, and practices in other large cities so that we can learn from their successes and challenges. In New York City, challenges include differing perspectives on what meals should be served, increased expectations among older adults, resulting in shopping around for the best meal and programming, balancing generational preferences regarding food as older seniors prefer more traditional congregate, meal, congregate meals and younger generations focus more on nutrition, and varied food costs across the system. Staff from our agency and from OMB visited and did outreach to senior centers to engage directors, other staff, and attendees about their food programs, including what works well and what needs to be improved and how to achieve those improvements. The centers are, are of varied sizes and are located in different boroughs. Some serve meals prepared on site and others serve catered meals. 
The sites include Brookdale Senior Center and Councilmember Eugene's District, KCS Flushing Senior Center and Councilman Valone's District, and West Brighton Senior Center and Councilmember Rose's District. Similar to the Phase 1 Senior Center model budget work, DIFT has been working with OMB on an extensive data analysis to determine what constitutes adequate funding levels for purchasing and preparing food, as well as adequate salaries for hiring and retaining qualified food-related staff. In this analysis, we're comparing the cost of pre preparing regular meals and kosher meals, controlling for the size of the centers, and looking at centers cooking in their own kitchen versus those using caterers. Through this multifaceted approach to learning about food programming, we'll attain results that will allow us to ensure that dollars are expended wisely and effectively, while at the same time, senior centers are given flexibility to structure their programs in a way that can best need the needs of their communities and the desires of seniors opting for a meal. We're working with OMB on this analysis and expect to have results to share later this spring. Thank you again for this opportunity to provide testimony on Senior Center model food budgets. I look forward to our continued efforts together to address the needs of older New Yorkers. I'm pleased to answer any questions you may have. <clears throat> Thank you, Commissioner, for your testimony. Um, I'm going to have Council Member Valong start with uh, questions. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Commissioner. Lots here. Lots that we've talked about over the last five years, and thank you to the advocates and the, all our seniors that are out there. Thank you for always coming to our hearings. Margaret and I draw our strength from you, as does Danny and all the rest of us. Um, you know, today there's also speaking about a budget on Thrive NYC's tremendous $850 million budget. And I know you mentioned that there is a <coughs> portion of some additional mental health funding going towards DIFTA or somehow allocated in this. My, my question is, is there coordination or additional funding from Thrive that's coming to DIFTA for senior services? Um, we're really going to address that at our budget hearing, which is coming up in just a few weeks. But um, yes, we did get additional resources through um, Thrive NYC. Are any of those resources allocated for this topic, for additional funding for meals and senior center allocations? No, those are specifically, I believe, for mental health services. It would not be part of this um, phase two of the model budget. Well, that might be something that we can look into. Uh, I think there are, uh, DIFT is always challenged by how much you have to do and the budget that our chair is always fighting to increase um, because it's just obviously no matter what we put in is not enough with the amount of seniors that are aging. Um, I think we need to use that interagency approach to alleviate the burdens, as you always go from this, capital expenses, expenditures, allocations for meals. Uh, the list keeps on going, and it keeps falling to DIFTA to pick up. And I think there are there's funding there. We need to fight for our share of that. Uh, the local law 140 that Margaret and I passed last year is really what brought us to this, because in past hearings, we kept asking for the data, the data, the data, and one of those examples of how much insurmountable data there is that DIFTA has to provide for us. So we passed Local Law 140 requiring DIFTA to break down this information. Um, I think you started to give it to us, but you didn't flush it all out. You were saying that the 249 senior centers divided into five groups, um, but then that was it. So so where is I can the, um, where how is that I mean w in order for us to properly dig down into the allocation to the centers how they're using that funding and what funding they receive especially with the additional 10 million baseline but maybe you can help us on that so thank you for local law 140 um, it took us a great deal of time to gather and collect all of that data um, and it is available we have shared it with the council and I can walk you through a little bit of what's in there. And a great deal of what we're talking about today has all of that raw data available. And so you can get a sense of the scope and the depth and how much raw data there is for us to analyze. I think that's critical for us to see how the yeah. five groups are broken down, even just to start the conversation and how you're separating that with the data so we can move forward with that. So just to give you a quick summary, um, 
in Local Law 140, what we reported out are the total annual reimbursed expenditures for congregate meals, um, the total annual reimbursed expenditures for congregate meals that are disaggregated by kosher and non-kosher, the cost per meal for each of the 249 senior centers, um, the cost per meal for each senior center disaggregated by kosher and non-kosher, and the, ne the method by which the senior center provides congregate meals, either in-house preparation or catered meals, and whether the senior center provides meals for any other senior center. Karen, you just went through the next five questions. So if you can break so down. So it's that's all exactly there. It. And you know that's supposed to be publicly listed yes, also. Yes, and it? I it is. Is it? Yes. Okay. You can find it on DIFTA's website. That's important. All right, so then continue, because those, those are the categories that really we're focusing on, on the different type of the ethnic meals, the preparation meal costs, the staffing of the costs, the, the contracts that are being provided, like you mentioned with KCS and some of the other providers that are out there. I mean, there are a few more things that I can sure. mention, right. but there's kind of endless tabs and data, so I, I can't walk you through Well, I think those are the main categories. I think maybe take it from there. There's also the combined total cost per person for information and assistance and for ed and rec and health promotion and the description of services in each area, um, the percentage of service utilization based on actual units of service versus the planned units of service in information and assistance, ed rec and health promotion, um, the total number of employees, full-time and part-time, um, and the total budget and amount for personnel services. So, so what's really the next step with that data now? Are we going to take a look at some of the larger some of the larger senior centers and some of the smaller ones and some of the differencing in cost needs for them, especially when it comes to food preparation? Because some of them are doing their own meals. Exactly. It's a it's an extremely diverse field. And we knew that, but you know, having now spent time visiting centers, speaking with participants, we get a greater sense of not only the diversity, but that people who cook prefer cooking, many that cater prefer catering. Um, so we need to take all of that into consideration and that all impacts cost. So I know our chair is gonna delve into that as, as is council member Drum, but what do you see then as the next step with that data? For us, we're trying to fight to get those additional costs because obviously each meal costs different and has different expenses. Obviously, whether it's kosher or halal or Asian or Korean or Chinese, there's additional costs that are not being subsidized or reimbursed for that. And it's usually falling on either the senior or the senior center. With this data coming in, is there going to be any different approach to how those expenses are being allocated? I don't know that we're there yet. We're continuing the analysis, so I can't comment on, on what the outcome will be. Um, but similar to the model budget process, I think we're going to come up with a model and then try and get everybody in the model. Will be this year's budget? Is that going to be part of what we're fighting for coming up? or are We, we expect to be able to um, conclude the analysis by late spring. Well, and then we will share it with you. Is, is that also going to be in coordination with phase two's data? Oh, I'm sorry. I was referring to phase two. Well, data. this is all kind of. Yes, it's all interrelated. Yes. So with. It's hard for us today to delve into data that's coming in the spring. But some of the things that are absent that the chair mentioned in her opening statement was costs for preparation for meals and staff. Uh, food and meals is expense, having varying costs and an increased cost, and ones we just mentioned about ethnic meals. Uh, the preparation for meals and staffing, how are we going to address those additional costs? Um, as I mentioned, Local Law 140 does have a lot of that data. Um, so you can begin to look at it. Well, it may have the data, but then we need to fund what the data is telling us to do. So are we planning on taking that data and increasing the costs for the additional staff? I mean, that's one of the things we're always looking for is the staffing budget, the overhead costs out of see. The underlying focus of the of 140 and what Chair and I have been always is, is the tremendous burden of the overhead costs of any senior center. Uh, these are all parts and components of that. So. Uh, meals are just one segment mm -hmm. of that, but if we can get them additional assistance for the different layers of the costs, that's where this data will be used so helpful to show parity at the centers, to show the fight for the also increase. So I, mean, I give you the opportunity then 
to say, will that be part of the budget ask as we move forward from budget to final budget com conversations and discussions? Because it's been an annual ask, an increase to meet those average rise of costs, because it hasn't been an increase in the cost of meal in years, and the right cost is. So we're, this data, is, I believe, is just going to reflect that. It's just going to confirm that. So I just, for you as the acting commissioner, we want to make sure that you're going to get that increase by advocating for it and telling us what you think is the next plan for DIFTA to tackle that. God bless you. <laughs> There's a lot of sneezing today. So as I mentioned earlier, you know, the overarching goal of our whole model budget initiative, including phase two, is to increase resources and to ensure strong programming and services across the whole network and to create parity and equity. And that's what we're driving toward. Do you have a goal for creating parity and equity as to a budget number? What would get us to parity and equity for our senior centers? Because we all want that. Yes. And so it's a shared goal and a shared vision. And until we have concluded the analysis, we will share it with you at that time. Well, we will always continue the fight with you, not against you, because that's what we're trying to do. So I Chair, appreciate that. Chair Chin, I'll gladly turn it to you, to your hearing. Councilman Woodrum, do you have any questions? Yes. <clears throat> Thank you very much. And I do have to leave shortly, too. So I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, I heard in your testimony that you mentioned that uh, some centers are serving Indian food. Uh, can you tell me where? In Queens, India House serves Indian meals. And how is that financed? I'm trying to get to specific information about specific programs. I believe it's largely through discretionary funding. Through discretionary, right. So actually, it's not coming through the DIFTA budget. And I think we really need to focus on that. And j not just Indian, but all South Asian all, foods. Yes. Um, and um, my understanding with India Home is that um, it doesn't operate on a daily basis and that they move the centers around. Yes. And then um, I believe that they cater in most of the food. So um, I would really urge that we look at that because there's an increasing population of um, South Asian folks uh, coming into the communities. And they're not quite as highly populated um, in certain areas where, you know, a specific senior center is actually offering that as a main option for them. Um, and, um, and because that's not the case, um, I don't see them like even in, center, even in centers like in Jackson Heights and Elmhurst. Um, so they don't really have any opportunity to get meals except for the times when, and I applaud India Home for the work that they're doing, but um, that um, they don't have an opportunity unless it's the day that India right. Home is operating a program somewhere near. And oftentimes it's not even like Jackson Heights. It might be Sunnyside that they have to travel to, which is then hard for the seniors to travel to as well. So I think we really have to address this um, growing community. Thank you. We're taking that into consideration. Okay, I hope it's in the plan. And uh, as uh, Council Member Vallone, uh, as, as advocated, and, and as uh, Council Member Chair uh, Margaret Chin, who has been a champion on food issues, especially for our seniors in budget negotiations, uh, we look forward to, to hearing that at the budget hearings and certainly going into the executive budget as well. So thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Drum, you are our finance chair. <laughs> we're counting that's on you. Why I'm that's, right. <laughs> that's why I'm talking about the, yes, the budget. Yes, we're yes, counting we need to have that in the budget from the mayor's that's side. Right. And yep. I think from the commissioner's testimony, it doesn't sound like, and it better not be, uh, that you're going to be able to put the money in phase two uh, before the budget is passed. Because I didn't see anything in the preliminary budget. Um, the understanding was there was supposed to be at least another 10 million for FY20. Wasn't that 20? In this year. 21. Right? It's, it's for FY21 for phase one, the second, the additional $10 million. 
as far as I remember, when we did the year of the senior in 2017, <laughs> um, there was only a gap of one year um, in terms of the baseline. So that's why we're looking at the food component, that that money needs to be in this year's budget. So the, the first infusion of 10 million was in 18, and that's baselined going forward, and then the second uh, 10 million was for FY21. We, <laughs> no? we don't agree with you on that. Okay. All right, because um, the budget was negotiated in FY, in, in 2017, and it started in 2018, the first 10 million which took a while to get out, mm -hmm. right? And um, I think that part of it was that center um, that got the extra funding, um, some of them were allowed to spend it on other things, like a one-shot um, special needs yes. or whatever. How many of those uh, DIFTA center that came back to you and said that they want to use that extra money uh, to cover you know, food costs or food service staff? Um, it was a, a small number, about 12 or so, that came back and asked for, to use it for other staff or, or services. And our budget director handled each of those requests. And we did allow for some one-time um, expenditures if there was a piece of equipment that needed to be replaced. So you don't know how many came back specifically to you? About a dozen. 12. 12 that asked to use it to supplement for their food budget or mm -hmm. food service staff. Okay. But at the same time, though, uh, we thought that with the, the model budget, um, the money that the council allocate for senior center enhancement, um, Difter asks us to maintain that pot because is it, the center still needs it. Um, so I just assume a lot of the center use that money to cover either the food costs or staff costs because they say they still need that money. But some of the center that I was looking at the the chart, the analysis, they got more money um, from the model budget. So in reality, they shouldn't need that extra funding from the city council unless they have to use that money for their food budget and the food service staff. I, re I can't comment on that, but. I mean, if she has data, she wants to share. Yes. I mean, if you have data you'd like to share with us, we would certainly take a look at it. Well, just the, all, the list of all the, the senior center that we fund through the enhancement. Um, in last year's uh, budget negotiation, our council staff were told that, they have to say, oh, we, we still need it for these centers. Um, so going forward, I think my question is like, look, the model budget is supposed to take care of their needs but we still, the council still have to supplement. And because the food part is not taken care of. So that's the expectation and the goal through the phase two food portion is to be able to address that and create, create some parity and And that's why I think with, the, the, with the phase two, the money needs to be in this year's budget. And it didn't make it to the preliminary, but it needs to, be in the executive budget. Whoever's here from the administration, you gotta hear that loud and clear. Thank you, I do hear you. <laughs> loud well, and I'm clear. talking about people who are we know representing you. City we Hall too. You. <laughs> Aaron, you always <laughs> Oh, I mean like this, well the center is gonna testify later and the advocates, mm -hmm. but like enough already, we've been waiting. I know that, you know, it takes time to do analysis and and get it together, but even basic information, the food cost goes up, food service worker, they're not getting paid enough. Um, meanwhile, yes, we took care of the director, the assistant director, 
But the people who, to, you know, who work, who serve the food, we didn't take care of them. And we need to do that. And I know that you say, oh, there's a, they got a COLA increase. It's not enough. They should be paid. And a minimum wage increase. Yeah, minimum wage. But they should be paid more than minimum wage for, for what they do. And when we talked to some of the provider, um, the, the samples that they gave us from what the, the, the kitchen cook or the chef, their responsibility is much, much more than minimum wage. I mean, they have to plan the menu, shop for the food, besides cooking and making sure that everything is, you know, nutritious, follow. Because Stifter has a lot of rules for the food, you know. You can't put too much salt. You can't put too much sugar. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of rules and regulation that they got to follow. We do. There are <laughs> federal, state, and local regulations that we have to follow. And meanwhile, you know my biggest beef about some of those other privatized places but they don't follow any of the rules but this way well, due to other legislation now the department of health is going into yes those inspections yes and it's going to start very soon yes uh thank you but i think for <laughs> even that was a battle I remember they were saying that wasn't our jurisdiction it was state run uh, i kept saying anything that happens in our city we should be able to have our hands on and now we're getting inspectors they didn't have the inspectors now we're getting inspectors but that's all part of what we find out so in, from your testimony, so what you're telling me yes. is that your analysis is going to be done by late spring. So you do not foresee putting any additional funding at all for this year's budget. I mean, I, starting for the next fiscal year, which is FY20. We can't comment on the executive budget. So, no, I didn't say that, but. But you need the funding, right? <laughs> you need the funding for the food part and the food service worker, yes. right? So the money's got to come from somewhere. We, we need are it. about we to embark on the uh, budget hearing, so I think you're going to hear more on this topic. Oh, definitely. The first day of the budget hearing, yes. OMB is going to get I know I'm going to be back question. here in just a few weeks, so <laughs> we will have another opportunity to have this Well, the, the budget hearing uh, for the Committee on Aging is on March 12th. We will be in the chambers, uh, and the public can testify that day. But the first hearing, um, I think, with uh, OMB and uh, the Finance Committee will be on March 6th. Yeah. And that's when we will have an opportunity to ask a question <laughs> and we'll do the same thing um, because it's critical. I mean, if this budget is so minimal, it's so small and the work that you do is so great. I mean, the senior population, it's going to be surpassing the pre-K population very, very soon. Right. And I think from your, your, your report, your testimony, uh, the study that you you did with Fordham University, prove our case. Fordham. Seniors who go to senior centers are healthier, stronger, prevent illness, serious chronic illness, saving the government a lot of money. So if we invest now, more seniors will be healthier and stronger. It just makes sense for the investment, right? And so that this is what we got to push. We want our seniors to be healthy and strong. We got to make that investment and we got to make it now. So 10 million baseline is good, but it's not enough. I mean, even that is not even enough for the centers. We want to really grow that number. And I, you know, I didn't get a chance to talk to our finance chair, but I will remind him <laughs> that India Home is not part of DIFTA's 249 portfolio. India Home is funded by the City Council Initiative for Senior Center Serving Immigrant Population. So they, don't, they are not even a DIFTA-funded senior center. And we have 10 of those. And hopefully DIFTA will be able to pick them up in the next RFP because seniors growing um, and we need more senior center more and not less. 
So that is something that why we're advocating so hard to make sure that we have adequate funding so that we can increase number of centers and make them, making sure they're well run. That's what our partnership is all about. And right? I thank you for your advocacy. <laughs> Well, based on the data you do have, do you have the breakdown of how many senior centers came back to DIFTA asking for additional food or meal staff reimbursements and what those costs would be to get them back out of the red? Um, I, I mentioned that earlier, that it was about a dozen programs that did come specifically and ask for either food staff increases um, and we rejected those based on waiting for the phase two model, but we did approve one-time expenses for people that had kitchen equipment problems. That, that's another area. So if yeah. there is a kitchen, if there's a uh, machine equipment, some of the food preparation, how do the centers get repairs? Is it all through DIFTA? Is there a different capital allocation for that? Is there a different expense allocation? Generally, uh, the Kitchen process maybe. is that the, you know, the request is made uh, through their program officer and it's brought to our budget department and we fund them as repairs are needed. Do we have a... Through expense, not capital. Do we have a list of if those repairs are up to date, how long the wait list is, what the costs are for that? Yeah, we don't have a wait list. We, we take care of them as the requests come in. So DIFT is able to handle the requests as they come in? We don't, I know we've had this conversation yes. also of a past <laughs> hearing. It seems a bit overwhelming. Again, I'm always thinking there's too much on DIFTA's plate, especially when it comes to capital and expense repairs, but, uh, or should be at least different allocations for that. So all, all our kitchens are, are there aren't any outgoing, ongoing requests for repairs or all? I see yeses in the audience. I guess that's a good thing if you're saying yes. If on staffing, same thing. Are we any requests for staffing increases at the centers that you're seeing? That is it because of the increase of the amount at a particular center that they're short on staff? Have those requests also come to you? I mean, th those lines are budgeted, and so that, I mean, we don't really get those requests. How are they handled budget-wise? Are there different allocations for the size? I think that's part well, of the As we the went through the model budget, there are staffing patterns that were identified, and as people needed to hire additional staff, they were able to use that funding to, to do that or to give increases to existing staff. So do we have any of that feedback? Was that enough? Is there additional staffing and or increases that are being asked for by the centers that have come to your attention? Maybe on a case by case basis, but not uh, across the network. And is any of that for kitchen staff? Kitchen staff, those who are actually preparing the meal. I mean, we, everybody like was mom. you know, asked to wait for the phase two of the model budget. So that's the goal of what this exercise is now. Okay, and I'm in my last, because some of these, there's some, I mean, obviously yeah. we can go each way, but, but the way the chair uh, has broken down the different categories, and you have, one of them is obviously, we haven't talked too much about home delivered meals. So mm. can you give us an update on where we are with the home delivered meals, if there's any RFP coming up? where we are uh, today, and does DIFTA include in the home delivered meals fees that come up for that? You know, so much of that the center has to, or the provider has to incur the maintenance of the vehicle, parking tickets, insurance costs, funding, and staffing of those. Is any of those being considered with the home delivered meals? So I'd prefer to have a separate conversation about the home delivered meals because I think there's been a lot of conflating between the congregate food meal budget and, and the home delivered meals process. Um, but again, we're continuing to analyze and look at different models, look at all of the different models that exist in our network and try and come up with um, and work with the community. And we have an RFP. Um, scheduled for 
RFI. So our hope would be to issue some kind of an RFI in advance of a concept paper and do a tremendous amount of community engagement. Um, as you know, it's a hot button issue. Once we talk about food in general, everybody has an opinion and um, a feeling about how things should move forward. So we want to make sure we collect all of that input from everybody. Um, Wasn't that happening now? I mean, isn't that part? Yes. So, but we, you know, there's a. When was the last time an RFP was issued for? It's it's been quite a long time. So I yes. Know we were talking about. The time is. Come. Come. Time is come. So when do you envision the RFI prior to the RFP? Just so. Um, the first step, just for those who may not know, there's there's first that the collect the collecting of the data. Information. We, it's right, um, information. to sort of get a sense of the landscape out there and what kind of thoughts and ideas. Is that, that ongoing now? Come or is from that the going community. Down? We're doing much of that now. We've had stakeholder, um, we're going to roll out a whole engagement plan to make sure we get input. We're going to survey seniors themselves to get a sense of what they feel about um, the meals. Of course, you know, the clients are most important customer, so that's I would think very we heavily. most of that data now. So I, I, I would think you don't, I, I wouldn't think there's reinventing the wheel on that one. I think we pretty much know, I think, the costs of that and phase two is a little different. So when would you envision an RFP then to be issued? The schedule is to have an RFP. The drum roll. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, it's within the next year as we get all of our input and and gather all the information from the community. Well, we've we've respectfully heard that a few times, so I I think we need to put a a, a timeline cap on that so that we can get some type of certainty saying that the RFP will issue be I, so we can all prepare for it and get that and get our providers and our seniors know it's coming. Um, is there any talk of expanding? The providers and the and the the existing system that we're using to go beyond the meal providing service to a different level because so I know there are certain certain centers that do it all on their own there are certain others that will uh, contract that out are the thoughts now of expanding that for the RFP I mean we're those are all of the things on the table that we're looking at and we want to dialogue with the community so that we haven't made any decisions at this point um, but those are all part of the complex decision making. Yeah, Chair, Madam Chair, <laughs> I always turn to you. We've been uh, joined by Council Member Ayala. Do you have any questions? Um, I was trying to actually live stream in my car on the oh. way here so that I could hear a little bit, but you kept breaking up, Karen. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, but I just I have one question. I I, I don't want to. Ask questions that may have already been asked, but because we're seeing um, such tremendous change in communities like mine, um, where we now have like a Covello Senior Center, where um, we have a, a growing uh, Asian population of seniors, is there is there some sort of a, of of overview that happens? Uh, annually that better assesses what the, the specific needs of each center is to better accommodate new needs um, because I, I wonder as you know as we're seeing population shifts right we're not necessarily offering culturally relevant meals precisely anymore we're not offering the type of programming that you know but all people but all of the seniors benefit from and so I just wonder because I mean all of the we're, by 2030 we're expected to have this housing the senior boom right and and yep. how are we kind of accommodating for that now so one we work with all of our providers to make sure they are to the best of their ability providing culturally relevant meals and programs and I think across the network we do a very good job um, at doing that and we are also beginning the process so we are heavily involved in looking at many different aspects of our whole network in doing an analysis of the demographic data that really shows us where populations of seniors are living, where new immigrant groups are coming in. Um, we're starting to look as using language as a proxy for 
who's living in what areas and where they're expected to be um, by 2030. So we can see if our centers are in the right communities and serving the right populations in a culturally sensitive way. Yeah, thank you, I appreciate that. Um, before I continue with some of the other question, you know, for um, the Department of Homeless Services, yeah. they're also doing um, model budget uh, and doing, um, but they put some money into the preliminary budget as a, a placeholder while they're doing the analysis. And that's what I was asking the administration that put some money, you know, in the budget to show that you're making a commitment. They're doing it at another agency. Why couldn't DIFTA do that? How come you treat it differently? <laughs> and those bigger agencies. Well, I think the $10 million was the administration's commitment. And it but was that was a couple of years ago where we fought for the year of the senior. It was last year. Yes. Yeah, FY18, which is 20, 2017. The fiscal year is also always a year later. Yes. <laughs> That's not equal treatment, right? I can't comment on that whole process because I'm not familiar with it. Well, that's what I'm aiming at the, uh, the mayor's office representative sitting here, <laughs> all right? I'm not asking something that's totally, you know, off the wall, whatever. Hey, another agency did that, okay? They put money in there uh, as a commitment. So why couldn't we do that uh, for DIFTA? Um, the question we have about the food analysis is that you have this consultant guy house. What is the total value of the guy house contract? And over, uh, what is their, the scope of work that they're getting paid for? And milestone that they're, they're supposed to um, agree to? So the guide house um, consultancy is really strictly focused on home delivered meals and the food service analysis we're currently engaged with is really with OMB. Um, and they did some data analysis to help inform that partnership with us and OMB as we move forward. So they're not doing the, the analysis for the congregate meal? No. So are, is that contract completed already? No, I believe they're expected to be uh, continuing that consultancy through. Um, I think she, I think there's a separate contract for congregate meals. There's one contract yeah. that's for home delivered meals and it's extending for another several months. I don't know exactly. Yeah, so the contract for home delivered meals extends for another few months. Okay. Now, okay, so they're not doing congregate meetings. No. It's OMB is doing it. All right. DIFTA. A DIFTA and OMB. Um, you know, in your uh, testimony, you talked about um, the Fordham University study. Yes. Uh, which is terrific. Now, does Guy House, would they have done an analysis uh, to provide a dollar? estimate on how much the city save on services like hospital, psychiatric ward, nursing home, and emergency food uh, when it invests an additional dollar into nutrition or health services at senior center? No, that was not part of the scope of service. So they didn't do that? No. Well, it would be interesting. It is interesting. To uh, DIFTA should look into that to make a strong case that every dollar that the city invests in our senior center save us how much money. We, we could definitely use that data. I mean, it's in the, it's in the study, but it needs to be translated into dollar values. We've, we've long been interested in doing that, um, and I believe some of the universities have begun to engage or have certainly talked about doing that kind of analysis. Have, have there been any kind of um, 
analysis. We'll talk to our colleagues at uh, Brookdale Center on Aging and others that uh, do this kind of analysis and see if any of that's available. Okay. If not, then maybe yes. Dick should take it on to prove your case that senior centers is so important because it's helping to save the administration, the city money. I think the Fordham study is a seminal study in that way, that it's the first time we had some concrete evidence. I mean, we know anecdotally that we all believe that we're doing good work that saves health care um, dollars, but that was our first evidence, and we would love to do a deeper dive and see if we can do that kind of analysis or work with institutions that are doing that. Good. We'll follow up on that. Um, Looking at the, the, uh, the range of reimbursement that you have for food costs, does that take into consideration of the salary, like the average salary of kitchen staff, or you just assume that everybody should be paid minimum wage and that's it? I mean, are there like different salary range or average salaries for the... I mean, what the data shows, and you can see that in the Local Law 140 report, is that there is a great range in, in salaries that are paid. So I think part of the Phase 2 exercise is to look at some modeling so that there would, can be more equity and parity across the system, similar so it, to the Phase 1 model budget process. So the, the meal reimbursement money actually includes food costs, food preparation, the staff that take care of the, the food part? Does it also include maintenance if they cook, uh, if they prepare food in their own kitchen? Does that increase, I mean, does that include maintenance mm -hmm. for their kitchen to be able to do All the cooking, on time? prep, and everything that goes into the cost of actually producing a meal. It's included in that meal reimbursement. And that's why there's such a, a range of difference. Exactly. Okay. Are you hearing from centers that there, and do you have any data on kitchen staff uh, turnover from your, the providers? I think, do you want to answer that well, from we, our? We hear it anecdotally. Yeah. And Yeah, we've heard we've heard this anecdotally, I'm sure, as you have, and in our site visits um, that OMB accompanied us on, we did hear that anecdotally as well from uh, staff at the centers that we visited. So we've decided to survey the whole system now. I'm going to survey the whole system to get a better sense of that. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, that's why it's so important to make sure that the money is in this year's budget to start taking care um, of the food service, you know, staff salary and making sure that we can maintain good food service staff at the senior center. I mean, if they're not pay well, um, some of them are gonna leave. And also they rely on a lot of volunteer. That's, that's not even added to the cost. There's so many volunteers that help serve the food and all that. So all we're paying for is really the people who are in charge. Um, we just got to have the money in this year's budget. There's, there's no way out on that one. <clears throat> Do you get a lot of requests for um, from centers about their uh, repairs for kitchen equipment. We get recurring requests for kitchen equipment. And you have uh, a budget line that take care of that. We don't have a separate budget line, but as we have the funding available, I'm looking at my budget director over here, we are able to cover those costs. Yes. Mm-hmm. So do you know for last year, um, for FY19, how much money did you spend on emergency repair, kitchen equipment repair? I, I'm sure we'd have to go back and, and get that analysis for you, but we can. Yeah, you could provide that. We can do that. And sure. like, you can't, I mean, you gotta have some, 
dedicated resource for that because things happen. I mean, like those those repair needs to be done. I mean, that's the same. It goes back to the the cap the hearing that we had about the capital budget that DIFTA also need to have a capital budget. We make those repairs with expense money, actually. And you <laughs> you just accrual money, and so you use that money to do this kind of emergency repairs. I mean, that's one of the ways we're able to finance it, yes. But most of these would not be capital eligible. We went through that at our last year. Yes, we did. So I'm not going to drill down. Uh, okay. So in the, I know we, we talk offline about the, the 38 centers that are not included um, in the model budget. Are they, are they included in your food service analysis? All of the data about those are included in the report we issued for mm -hmm. Local Law 140. So you can look at the meal costs and the utilization and the budgets in those programs. But then you, they, they are sort of like separated out from your your 249 um, I mean we're not even talking about norks and all the other all the other good program that that are around um, but we also have to kind of come up with some solution what to do with them and how do we make sure that that the programs can continue to run or expand and get the support that they need instead of being you know left out of this model budget process Right. Not all of the 38 serve food, and as we discussed, we're mm -hmm. happy to have that conversation with you offline, and we'll do a little more analysis about those programs. Okay. When was the last time that DIFTA funded a baseline increase for meals across all the senior centers and home deliver meal? And what was that increase? FY15, I believe, there was an across-the-board increase in the reimbursement rate for food, and I believe at that time we also did a differential for kosher meals for the first time. FY15, so that was 2014. That was like almost five years ago. How much was that increase? You 25 cents a meal, and I think 50 for kosher. And for home delivered kosher, twenty five cents increase. Uh, cost of living. I mean, food price goes up. I, I think that's where the urgency is. I mean, the centers are hurting. I mean, they need the relief as quickly as possible. I mean, we the advocates will tell us again that we are below the national average in terms of the the food reimbursement. Because even though we are only asking seniors to make a contribution, but that yeah. contribution has increased. And some of the centers are forced to increase the food contribution to make up, you know, for the lack of revenue. So that's why I want to say it again, got to put some money in this year's budget now. Chair, did we, did we get any information on the 38 NYCHA senior centers? Because uh, they wasn't included in phase one. Are they going to be re-included? Well, those, re that was the 38 that I was talking about. about. Okay. We're yeah, going to have a separate conversation about a separate, them. Okay. <laughs> separate conversation. Right, well, one of, one of NYCHA alone, I think, is something. Yeah, I think um, yeah. there another some area to okay. tackle yeah. sister agencies for budget. As the NYCHA budget's increasing with the crisis that's happening with NYCHA, I believe this should be part of that. I think there's ways for us to include ourselves, whether it's Thrive, whether it's NYCHA. I think anytime there's a senior involved, there should be an allocation from those billions that are being allocated to assist DIFTA in these. And I think that's part of one of the areas we can fight for. Okay. Okay. I think any other question we uh, did not get a chance to ask, we will send it Happy over to, to you. 
happy to respond. Yes, and thank you. Thank you. I appreciate our partnership. We do too. But we just want to be loud and clear this year that we're not going to take anything less. They've got to put more money into the budget for DIFTA, right? So thank you for testifying, and uh, we are going to start the, the public session. Can I clap? <laughs> Oh, there are more chairs up here. Okay, we're calling up the next panel. Abigail Pick from UJA Federation, Molly Kukowski from JASA, Andrea Chiafani from Live On New York, and Tower Klein from United Neighborhood Houses. Uh, you were all hiding behind the pillar. That's why I couldn't see. You are all right behind the pillar. God bless you. On behalf of UJA Federation of New York and our network of nonprofit partners, thank you Chairperson Chin and members of the Aging Committee for the opportunity to submit testimony on the importance of supporting New York City's older adults. My name is Abby Pick and I manage the anti-poverty portfolio at UJA Federation New York. Established more than 100 years ago, UJA is one of the nation's largest local philanthropies. UJA's mission is to fight poverty, connect people to community, and respond to crises both locally and globally. UJA thanks the City Council and Chairperson Chin for securing baseline funding for Dif from DIFTA and FY18, specifically around model budgets for senior centers. Despite a noted increase rate of food insecurity among older adults, funding for meals, equipment, and kitchen staff at senior centers has not been included in these model budgets. Additionally, New York City-funded congregate meals are reimbursed at a rate that's 20% lower than the national average, and senior centers in our network have reported running out of food for weekend and holiday meals. We therefore urge the council to work with the administration to invest an additional $20 million for congregate meals. Similarly, home delivered meals, and in particular kosher home delivered meals, which on average are 30% more expensive than a non-kosher meal, are reimbursed at lower than national average as well, presenting a unique challenge for our agencies who provide services to clients who keep kosher. We therefore request that an infusion of $15 million to support home delivered meals be included in the FY20 budget as well. While food insecurity rates among most New Yorkers have declined, rates among older adults, adults have increased. As many as one in four seniors living at home are nutritionally at risk. UJ Federation New York respectfully urges your consideration and support of these vital programs that assist our city's most vulnerable. Thank you for your time. Good morning. Good morning, uh, Chairwoman Chin, Council Members of the Aging Committee. Thank you so much for holding this important hearing today. I'm Andrea Chanfrani. I'm the Director of Public Policy at Live On New York. We're a nonprofit uh, membership organization of about 100 community based organizations serving seniors throughout New York City, and we're really happy to be here today to talk about this important issue. Um, I do want to start out by thanking the Council for your steadfast support um, over the years, over the decades of senior services throughout New York City. It's critical, and, and we know that you are very supportive of these issues. I do also want to acknowledge and thank uh, the leadership at DIFTA and Acting Commissioner Resnick for her work and increasing um, stakeholder in input throughout these processes over the past several months and, and looking forward as she has testified today. Um, I do want to um, focus my testimony today in two areas. Um, first is fairness. Um, support, you know, we support the spirit of New York City being the fairest big city in America, um, you know, but fairness does not have uh, an age cutoff. We really believe that when DIFTA is receiving less than 1% of the city budget,
budget and senior meals are funded at 20% below the national average, we can do better. New York City needs to be a fair city for all ages, and we fully support initiatives and smart policy that will get us there. And we can do this. Uh, the second is focused around smart investments. Um, Chairwoman Chin, you raised a great point earlier about the dollars invested in senior services and what that saves and what that goes to. And we fully agree, and we think that that's really important as part of all of these conversations. Um, you know, we also know we're aware of the headlines in this fiscal year with pegs, and you know, and but we also we believe in you know in good times and in not so good times that investing in senior services is smart fiscal policy. It's responsible, and the money that is invested in senior services stretches across the community. It supports seniors. It supports the services that they use, that we will all use, the infrastructure we're building for New York City as we all age. And really importantly, it supports the individuals who have chosen their profession of serving older adults through nonprofits and senior services. So, um, you know, again, we, we really want to support smart investment in city services, and we know that senior services is top of that list for, for turning a dollar and stretching it across to build our communities. Um, so how do we get there? How do we make uh, New York City a, a fair city for all ages? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> we, um, we have several recommendations fully outlined in our testimony, but we really want to focus today, um, and you'll hear a lot more in our budget testimony, um, but really want to focus on congregate meals and home delivered meals today. So first is investing um, $20 million in congregate meals. You've heard a lot about phases, model budgets. Um, I just want to clarify the, the first investment um, was a total of $20 million promised in model senior center budgets. As you know, $10 million of that went out to um, centers late last year, um, and that was directed towards senior center staff and programs. Um, that is great. It's a very important first step. Um, the second 10 million of that that is promised is promised by FY21. So those are two really important things to keep in mind because that money can, should, and we advocate should go out immediately. The needs are there and we know that that can happen. So that's a total of 20 million. Again, that as you heard today, was directed at direct staff and programs. Very important. Um, that said, um, we made those initial investments. We started rebuilding the house. We forgot to add the kitchen. Um, the kitchen is very important. <laughs> um, so that is what we're talking about when we're talking about a second $20 million today. We um, are advocating for a $20 million investment this year um, in congregate meals. So that would cover raw food costs you heard today, the rising cost of food, the last time there was an um, increase that would um, go to senior centers to increase those meal costs that increase over time. It would support the staff who are incredible. Um, I know there's variation across the system, but we can figure that out. We can put that towards um, senior centers that um, you know are of all sizes and need um, different staffing needs. Um, if you, you all know because you visit your senior centers, you walk in. I walked into a senior center a couple weeks ago. I was stopped before I even got in the door and they talked to me about the incredible kitchen staff and the food. And you all hear that too. So you're going to hear about it, good, bad, everything in between. And it, it's the heart and soul of a senior center and it's what we need to invest in. So um, that would go to staff and, and as well as the mandates that you heard that are needed to um, run a kitchen, um, HVAC systems, ovens, equipment, things that break down, things that need to be serviced. So those are really important costs that this funding would go to um, that is needed immediately. Um, secondly, and, and again, I want to highlight that those needs are exacerbated at, at NYCHA senior centers and the important work um, building communities there that we need to invest in that Councilmember Vallone referenced as well. Um, the other pieces we're advocating for, um, home delivered meals, a $15 million increase as well to address increased need. And um, again, 20% below the national average, we need to, we need to do better. Um, we're also advocating, we'll talk about this at the budget hearing, but um, the pegs um, across the board, across the board pegs for all agencies for a agency such as small as DIFTA, it's unfair um, to kind of put that there. And we, we really believe that uh, DIFTA should not receive pegs. Um, Pushing out the $10 million that was promised immediately, we advocate for that. Um, and again, you know, um, the last thing I'll say, and, and Acting Commissioner Resnick referenced the increased transparency and involvement in the Senior Center Network in these discussions, and, and we agree with that, and we think it's really important, and we hope that continues and increases because we know that their input is valuable to these conversations as we build the city forward and prepare, prepare for the upcoming RFPs. So with that, um, I just thank you for, for hearing this and, and investing in senior services. Thank you. Thanks. 
Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, Chairwoman Chen, for holding today's hearing and the council members for being here and participating in this very important hearing today. My name is Tara Klein, and I'm a policy analyst at United Neighborhood Houses, which is the membership association of settlement houses in New York City. We serve all ages, multiple services. Uh, Across our services for older adults, we operate 41 senior centers. Our members operate 41 senior centers and eight home delivered meal programs. Uh, so as Andrea just mentioned, we are supporting uh, an increase for $20 million put into senior center congregate meal programs this year, as well as $15 million into the home delivered meals program for a total of $35 million in new investments in this year's budget. Meal programs are so critical for older adults, and good nutrition is a key determinant of health outcomes as people age. But unfortunately, hunger among older adults in New York City remains high, with approximately 11% of New York City residents over age 60 experiencing food insecurity. And that's even higher in the Bronx, where about 24% of older residents experience food insecurity. And access to congregate and home-delivered meal programs are a key part of the strategy to reduce that food insecurity. Um, unfortunately, um, providers face major barriers in serving meals to seniors in those programs due to cost and low reimbursement rates from DIFTA. Uh, as we've heard, the true meal costs for programs include raw food, disposables, supplies, kitchen maintenance, equipment, emergency repairs, exterminations, inspections, and staff. And for home delivered meals, they also include vehicle maintenance, gas, heating, cooling systems, and parking costs and tickets, as well as the OTPS and the indirect and the rent and the utilities and the human resources, all of that. And DIFTA contracts don't cover the full cost of providing meals, making it difficult for providers to run effective programs that adequately support their populations. Organizations will often incur deficits to meet the needs of their communities and ensure seniors receive meals. Daily attendance at senior centers tend to fluctuate, which also has an impact. One UNH member has said that they are contracted to provide 65 daily lunches at their center, but regularly provide over 90 due to increased attendance, and yet they're not reimbursed by DIFTA for those additional incurred costs. Uh, there's an outside impact, as we've heard, on programs that serve culturally appropriate or relevant meals or therapeutic meals, as they often cost more. And according to Hunger Free America's most recent annual report, 34% of food pantries and kitchens in New York City were forced to turn people away, reduce their portion sizes, or limit their hours of operation due to a lack of resources. This is a real systemic problem. Um, we've heard about the, the national average cost of meals and meal reimbursements, and we know that New York City is 20% below that rate. Um, we know that the cost of living is also higher in New York City, inflating these numbers that are out there even more. Um, we know that the cost of food has increased every year. Um, I want to mention that the council uh, gave us some support and last year in fiscal year 19 added $2.84 million to the home delivered meal program, uh, which helped bring reimbursement rates up a little bit. Um, but unfortunately it wasn't baseline and it wasn't included in the preliminary budget. Um, and so that uh, is very important. Um, and again, the model budget, we're very appreciative of that $20 million and we agree that uh, extra $10 million that was promised by 2021 is needed urgently right now. Let's put it in. Um, and so all of these numbers, I think, offer some really clear justification on the need for additional funding. But there are also, of course, uh, stories behind uh, these numbers and the seniors who get the food, and especially the kitchen staff uh, who provide the meals. And I want to talk a little bit about uh, what we've been hearing on the ground from some of our members on uh, kitchen staff. Uh, they work very hard at very low pay. They're expected to do more than just prepare and serve food. Kitchen staff are really administrators. They complete inventory, order supplies, and create menus that cover nutritional requirements. Many supervise volunteers who help run the kitchens, uh, and there's other mandatory paperwork. At the same time, many of these cooks lack administrative job skills or don't have a high school diploma or many can't read in English. Uh, and programs fill this need by having their directors and other staff uh, fill in an, on an ad hoc basis. Uh, cooks must also be customer service representatives, of course, to serve the meals and keep the senior center attendees happy. Uh, while some senior centers have several staff members in the kitchen to share these responsibilities, small centers often just have one cook running the entire kitchen. If that cook is out sick or is taking personal time off, there's no substitute. Uh, the senior center director will often fill in, and they're not a cook. Um, 
For kitchens that prepare both congregate and home-delivered meals, staff often cook three meals a day and will work more than 12-hour days. And programs have expressed having to make a difficult financial choice between hiring more staff for low pay or overworking their existing staff. Uh, meal programs in the UNH network report paying kitchen staff around the minimum wage, with raises only given when DIFTA provides funding for a COLA or the minimum wage increase, as we heard. Uh, one UNH member expressed anger over feeling forced to reinforce poverty due to these low reimbursement rates and the consequential low salaries. This low pay has led to high turnover rates, with many staff opting to work at higher paying institutions like schools and colleges or at restaurants. And some UNH programs mentioned recent turnover at restaurants due to an uptick in fears of deportation for undocumented immigrants working in those restaurants. Uh, hiring is very difficult, and one program reported a job posting for an assistant cook that went unfilled for six months. So this is just a little bit of what we're hearing on the ground, and we really need uh, that additional investment. Um, I also wanted to echo what we've heard, what we just heard from Andrea about the PEG, uh, and we understand it's a difficult city budget year. Uh, we understand those constraints, but it's very urgent that DIFTA do not face any cuts under the PEG. Uh, the system has been underfunded for many years, and um, only recently have been, we've been pushing these new initiatives and working to get more funding into the system. We really can't afford to lose pace, especially with the new RFPs coming out for home delivered meals and senior centers soon. Um, so uh, yeah, so to reiterate, we, um, we want to make sure that uh, we meet the nutritional needs of New York's growing older adult population, support a decently paid workforce, and reiterate that, uh, ensure that programs are paid for the true cost of running meal programs. Um, and that will include that $20 million for congregate meals, $15 million for home delivered meals, as well as the $10 million in promise model budget money. Uh, so thank you for your time and happy to answer any questions. Hi, good morning. My name is Molly Krakowski. I'm Director of Legislative Affairs at JASA. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify today, uh, Ch Chairman Chin um, and members of the uh, committee. Um, JASA, for the last 50 years, has um, provided a whole range of senior services, one of which is um, 22 senior centers that we currently um, are, are the uh, operating. Um, of those 22 senior centers, the centers are, we have one in Manhattan, eight in the Bronx, nine in Brooklyn, four in Queens. Each center is unique. They vary in size, demographics, and programs. The senior centers are inviting setting. Um, they have very diverse communities um, in which they're based, and they offer a whole range of activities, health, wellness, and culturally appropriate meals. Uh, we're pleased to have the opportunity to address the meals specifically today. I'm not going to talk specifically about home-delivered meals, although I do want to just reiterate what my colleagues have said, because we do provide home-delivered meals, kosher home-delivered meals, which um, have taken a huge hit, um, and we've faced a tremendous deficit over the years, and the council has actually um, stepped in with speaker funding for the last few years um, to help fill some of that deficit, but it shouldn't be, that shouldn't be the system that we incur debt and then um, try and get councilmatic monies to patch it up. Um, but I'm going to focus on the congregate meals. Uh, Diffter Senior Centers operate with different reimbursement rates, as we heard earlier today. There was a study um, in 2017, Separate but Unequal, which was an analysis of the disparities in the New York City Senior Center funding uh, that was done by Union Settlement, and it showed that of the approximate 250 DIFTA senior centers, um, there was a wide range of how much their per meal uh, reimbursement rates were, from 3 to $6 to $18 on the top end. Um, all of JASA's 22 senior centers fall into that 3 to $6 range. Um, in addition, um, as we heard earlier, there's that additional expense for providing culturally appropriate kosher meals. And of our 22 senior centers, three centers provide a kosher meal option. 13 are exclusively kosher centers. Um, funding has not kept pace uh, with the growing expense, not with non-kosher meals, not with kosher meals. And our vendors are asking for increases, which frankly are completely reasonable. Um, but we just, we just don't have the money to do it. Um, the senior center contracts don't cover the full cost of the meal. Uh, the underfunding of services impacts on meal quality, and we know from the people who come and eat those meals that they say that it 100% impacts whether or not they utilize a center. In January, JASA participated in a roundtable discussion with other aging service providers in DIFTA. I think um, uh, 
the acting commissioner referenced that she's been meeting with um, community providers. Um, the meeting provided an opportunity to share concerns about congregate meal services, envision new possibilities going forward, and we explored alternate models in meal service delivery and flexibility as ways to increase utilization and appeal to individuals who have different eating habits. You know, we're always trying to find ways to get more people into the center. Well, what if there was a salad bar? What if we had vegan options? What if there were later evening hours instead of the traditional 11 30, 12 o'clock meal. All of those um, types of um, areas were discussed, as was the dining experience. Um, a lot of our centers are not the most inviting, exciting, looking physically spaces that you want to go into. Um, and what could we do to get better lighting and really increase the appeal of the facilities? But there was general agreement that all of those types of improvements and flexibility require an investment of money. Um, and it's costly. And so Jazz is joining with the other aging advocates and proposing a minimum investment of $20 million in baseline funding for DIFTA congregate meals. Um, the funding would bring meal costs closer to the national average. It would allow senior centers to operate with uh, adequate funding for food service delivery staffing and provide enhanced experience to participants. I want to just touch on, you know, phase one of the senior center model budget helped to begin address the salary inequity for some staff and insufficient and varying funding across DIFTA contracts. But unfortunately, not all DIFTA contracted senior centers were included in that initial evaluation. The first round of funding for the model budget only included senior centers that received DIFTA contracts through the 2012 senior center RFP. So what that means is that senior centers that were originally funded by city council members and then were baselined into the New York City budget um, are not included in that initial evaluation in phase one. So there were 38 senior centers, which included those initially um, baseline funding um, centers through the city council, as well as NYCHA social clubs and and. Um, that's more or less everybody, um, they were not even included in that evaluation. So they received no money for staff increases. They received no money for their programming. And now we're on to phase two, um, where I believe that they're not being looked at either because they're not considered part of that 249 initial RFP 2012 category. Um, and so I'm concerned, JASA is concerned that DIFTA revisit phase one centers that were not included in that initial evaluation to make sure that they're all brought up to speed. Um, they have almost, most of them have the same requirements. All of them have almost identical requirements as um, any other DIFTA senior center. Um, and I say almost all of them because I believe social clubs fall into a slightly different category. Um, but we need them to be evaluated. We have senior center directors who've been working for 20 plus years who are making significantly less now than their peers at other senior centers only because of how the senior center was initially funded. They're all baseline DIFTA senior centers. Um, finally, as the city tightens funding this year, we ask that DIFTA not be subject to any pegs. The agency is already less than half of 1% of the budget, and any cut to DIFTA is going to have a disproportionately negative effect on the community-based aging services network's ability to meet the needs of New York's growing and diverse population of older adults. So I thank you, and I thank you for um, really calling attention and, and pushing on um, what's going on with this model budget funding. Thank you. Um, thank you for your testimony. We will follow up with DIFTA on the 38 centers and make sure that, you know, that they're taken care of. And thank you. Before you go, uh, so much of what we do is such a big help from the super women at that table. So uh, we really appreciate that. And a lot of the questions and the hearings that we focus on come from these conversations. And it's amazing how much all of it is connected. When you were talking about if the meal's not what it's supposed to be, then they won't even come for the services at the senior center. And then now the meals at 11, 30, 12, but then God forbid Accessoride and all the wonders of that wonderful program um, and getting seniors too, and then just one after another. And if you have to pull funding from that to take away from programming, then the programming is a court. So that's why Chair Chin is always fighting for an overall increase on the budget because every area needs to be increased. And so much of this is part from the administration's plan. That's why we have to keep the pressure up for the funding for this critical thing. So thank you for all your testimony. Uh, we have also been joined by Councilmember Deutsch and Councilmember Trigger. Do you have any uh, questions or comments? Oh, Councilmember Trigger. Thank you, uh, 
the Chair Chin, again, once again, for your outstanding leadership and drawing attention to these very pressing issues. I just want a quick commentary uh, and agree with the points uh, raised by our, our great uh, champions for seniors um, with regards to how DIFTA's budget is small uh, com compared to many other of our city agencies and, and departments. And so uh, a, any potential peg will have a disproportionate impact on, on, on our most vulnerable populations, which we can't afford. And also, to the chair's credit, she's been drawing attention to the fact that with the continued emergence and, and growth of these social adult daycares, it becomes even that much more pressing that we stand by and stick by our senior centers and our senior providers, uh, because it, 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 it is, it's now becoming a very pressing Almost, almost an emergency situation in terms of just maintaining, uh, staying afloat uh, to provide critical services to our students. I want to thank all of you for drawing attention to this, for your work, and uh, I, I could assure you that our chair will not allow um, really anything to hurt our seniors. So thank you all for your, for your great uh, advocacy and your leadership. Thank you very much. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Councilmember Traeger, because we have strong committee members, and our committee has grown. <laughs> so we're definitely going to get more council member um, to join us in this fight for more funding. Uh, council member Deutsch? Uh, thank you. I'm sorry. I, I'm late. I just have, like, three hearings in the same time, and I just got a fourth one just came up. But I just want to, uh, first of all, commend our chair, who does an amazing, amazing job um, advocating for our seniors. and. And that also goes with all the advocates and all the people that are here today. But I just wanted to give a, a little statement and, and just to say that um, as we see the advocates and, uh, and sitting in the room, you don't have to wait for a hearing to bring up any issues that you have. So because there's so many things going on, and when you bring up like 10 or 15 things that are being discussed at a hearing, it becomes kind of uh, mixed messages. Not, not really mixed messages, but confusing. And also, um, it's very difficult to do 15 things to make sure we get done on, the, on all those issues. So if we have um, anything, like even during before hearing or after hearing, to bring these issues to the, your elected officials, and this way we could tackle it as they come and deal with it, on, because sometimes with dealing with agencies, there's so much, just so much red tape and bureaucracy that we need to, um, it takes a lot more than a hearing to fight for certain issues that come up at an aging hearing. So I just want to encourage anyone that when you do have, um, you know, any, any things that you want to be addressed, so let's tackle it one at a time, and this way we could get, actually, we could get the results that we need. And, uh, and also, working with the Department of Aging, we have a very good relationship with them, uh, with Karen Resnick. So, uh, a lot of it has to do beyond her, it has to do with the budget, and this is something we need to tackle. Uh, so I just want to say thank you again, for because I'm sure you, you're here, you're not getting paid for being here by the, by the hour of the week. So um, it's very important for us um, that you're all here today and taking of your time to, uh, and, being, and, and to address many of the issues that affect our seniors. So thank you. Council Member Deutsch, uh, we continue to strategize with our advocates, and especially this year. We, so we're going to be calling on you uh, to help us, too. Um, we wanted to, to see if you have some data in terms of your the members, uh, the providers, and the center that you run in terms of the, uh, the uh, overcost for the food, like you're running a deficit. Like, we could, if we can get some data in terms of which centers all running a deficit, you know, because of the food costs not being covered. Because sometimes the, at the end of the, the fiscal year, if they go to DIFTA, then DIFTA somehow finds some money, uh, or they let the council know that, oh, we need, we need your continued support with discretionary funding uh, to cover that. Uh, because I think the, the administration baseline a portion of it last year. But still, I mean, the, the council initiative is still over $2 million. I think that's a great question. I think um, 
the point raised today about the the um, information that is now available online, which we all are taking a look at closely, um, about um, that's a really good spart- starting point to know where we're starting, and then looking at what the council has funded um, over time through initiatives, as well as um, talking with our members. I think that's something we can we can work on together to to help provide information on. That would be great. It would Especially since we didn't get any. <laughs> it would be good. This way we can get some from you. I just wanted right, to say one of the, yeah, well, um, you mentioned it's a own. range, so but I could get it to you. I okay. could get you the actual numbers. Um, but I did want to mention that when um, you asked the question of the commi- of the acting commissioner about the number of centers that requested money specifically for food, mm-hmm. to be careful, I think it's a maybe a drop misleading in this sense that the budgets were all submitted. They had to be resubmitted multiple times. There were things that were not allowed to be asked for. So I don't think that the fact that 12 eventually ended up getting funding or pleading for funding for food-related expenses necessarily translates into the fact that all of those centers and sites wouldn't have or didn't initially include requests for funding related to food staff and concerns. That's my I would, uh, way of saying I, I, I think it's a little bit trickier than that. I mean, we eventually submitted budgets that we knew were within the guides of what we needed to submit and certainly needed that funding to go towards. And we're very grateful for the funding that we received for the centers that received the funding. Yeah, and I'd agree. I think, um, you know, the, the overarching goal of the model budget process is to promote fairness across the system and, and to kind of provide um, infrastructure building across the entire system. And, and um, as Molly pointed out, those uh, adding into that the 38 centers that weren't even evaluated. So I think, um, and I know that there was a push to get funding out the door quicker than probably would have been like to have been, you know, would it like to take more time. But I think, especially in this next phase, I think that's a really important point to look at to make sure that all centers that are receiving funding have information that they know what they can do with the funding. Because I think you're right. I think, um, you know, the idea was that it was to be directed towards staff and programming. And, um, you know, that's what most were told and thought. And, going back later and, and trying to negotiate. I think a lot of um, you know centers would have liked that flexibility, but you know we understand the time constraints, but I think in the spirit of fairness across the system, I am hoping that we can you know do that um, you know in a, in a broader way and especially with the round with with meals here. So I, I think that's a good point. Well, thank you. Thank you for your advocacy and thank you for coming uh, to testify today. Oh, Council Member Rose. <laughs> That's okay. Well, Sand Island did get a mention earlier. Did. Yes. <laughs> Let's hear from Sand Island. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Uh, we have uh, Rocky Chin from AARP, Brenda Gardner, uh, AARP, and yourself. <laughs> uh, Pauling Ng from the CPC Open Door Senior Center. Anybody else? Okay, give me again. Uh, good afternoon. Do I process? Good afternoon. <laughs> uh, I'm here um, representing ARP, and I'm really happy that, uh, that we're having this discussion. It's an ongoing discussion, and uh, my colleague and the staff member, Chris Bridello, who is over there, uh, can an- also help me answer questions if you have any. Uh, <coughs> uh, I'm going to cut our uh, testimony a little bit because we're running over, but it was excellent uh, running over because we really appreciate the the uh, robust advocacy of our 
uh, chairperson of the uh, city council com uh, committee here on aging, but also all the committee members. We really, really do want to appreciate the partnership that we have. Uh, ARP, my name is Rocky Chin. I'm a member of the ARP Executive Council for New York State. Uh, you should know that we have members upstate today as well and all this week uh, advocating for uh, 50 plus. Uh, on behalf of our over 800,000 members, age 50 and older in New York City, uh, I want to thank you for the opportunity to talk about congregate and home delivered meals in New York City. And just echoing, ARP wants to just echo the concerns and the needs of the advocates that have come before and that are going to speak today from the senior centers about the need to increase the funding for congregate and home delivered meals. So I'm going to just focus on the um, highlight the demographic need. I think you've mentioned this uh, many times before, but um, it's worth mentioning again. Uh, why we need to do better in the area of nutrition for older adults in New York City. Today, ARP, in partnership with the Center for an Urban Future, will release a new detailed brief about the aging of the population in cities and counties across New York State. Our analysis finds that older adults are the fastest growing segment of the population statewide. Over the past decade, the number of New Yorkers aged 65 and over increased by 647,000 or 26%. And during the same period, the state's overall populations grew by just 3%. There are now more New Yorkers age 65 and older statewide than there are children under the age of 13. I have included a few maps at the end of the printed testimony to illustrate the aging trend in New York City for those 65 plus and 85 plus. And there's actually an extra map there that we printed. Uh, additionally, this older population is much more diverse in New York City, the older immigrant population has grown even faster, increasing 42% over the past decade. And I should just add here that ARP earlier uh, in the year, in 2018, released a very important study working with partners addressing uh, disparate impact on uh, communities of color. And that's a very important initiative. So we, have, we in New York are very aware of that. Um, <clears throat> our congregate and home delivered programs are really, as has been said before, on the front line of ensuring older adults in New York City receive well-balanced meals every day, and also a key component of independence and aging in place. For some, it is often the only hot meal they will receive. Without congregate and home delivered meals, thousands of New York City residents would go hungry every day. So it is crucial, as you have said, and has, as you have av advocated in the City Council, that New York City keep pace with increased funds associated with improving uh, and these services and providing essential services. Um, so we cannot continually ask our senior centers pr providing congregate meals and home-delivered meals providers to do more with less. You have already heard from the providers about the obstacles they face every day, increased food costs, unfunded mandates on kitchens, the low wages, etc. When it comes to nutrition, New York City has made great strides to streamline the SNAP process for low-income residents across the city who meet eligibility requirements. We should take pride that in our public schools, students have access to nutritional meals free of charge. And during the summer, anyone under the age of 18 can receive free breakfast or lunch at hundreds of public schools, parks, pools, and libraries across the city. So isn't it time that New York City strive to ensure that no older adult goes without a nutritious meal? A step toward that goal is ensuring that our core programs, as we've talked about today, congregate and home-delivered meal, are positioned for success, and a major part of that is adequate funding Thank you for the opportunity to testify today, and uh, we look forward to partnering with you as we come back to City Hall, as we go to the mayor's office, as we go all over the state, <laughs> but we really b agree with you that now is the time to really address this inequity in terms of uh, funding for these programs. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. And really wanted to thank AARP for their support um, at our hearings. And definitely we need you at the state. We got to get the state to deliver too. Thank you. Good afternoon. Yeah. It's okay. Good afternoon. My lovely honorable and uh, Markley Chen, chair and a member of the city council. Thank you, you give us an uh, opportunity to, you know, listen our voice. That means I really want you to open your heart and open your ear to listen to us and give us a hand to resolve all the problem. Today, my name is Pauline Eng. I on behalf of the Chinese American Planning Council. Also, you know, and uh, I am the member of the AARP. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, and also you and Edge all the settlement house, because you know I work. Uh, I really love to serve the senior, so that's why I stay in the senior job for the fifty years. I enjoy my life because I thinking about senior so lovely, and. Uh, but uh, because that, I should provide wonderful quantity and quality service for our sister and brothers. But today, I really want to talking about and um, talking about the budget. Otherwise, because today is the budget hearing. But I really uh, thank you to the and the council. And really regarding about the model budget, relate to the food and the staff and also for the Kangpa Game Meal, Meals on Wheels. But I tell you the very good story, then you should support of Open Door. The Open Door opened our door 1972, but at the beginning, we only provide the multi social services. No meals on wheels, no congregate meals. Until 1979, we, our senior thinking about, they are very poor. They only based, uh, depend on the social security on, on that time is no SSI. How could they survive? So that's why we had a lobby and going to the department for the agent, fight for the Meal. Finally, they listened to us, gave us the Kangpa Game Meal since the 1979. But the 1980, I'm so happy because our former mayor, everyone knows, Mayor Koch. Mayor Koch and our former and the commissioner center come to open door for Wexit. On that time, I would cook, really cook the chicken. <laughs> ah, then you know our uh, the the mayor catch smelling and said that pulling could I taste? I said definitely you are the mayor, and uh, <laughs> then she tastes our food. Oh, such wonderful, very delicious. On that time, I said that mayor, right now is a good time. I ask you the money. <laughs> then, <laughs> I said that mayor. You are so lucky you had the chance and taste our food. But how about handicapped person? They, they are low income, they live alone, they stay home. Nobody take good care of them. They are the hunger, they are the lonely person. Who care of them? They said that, Pauline, what are you talking about? I said that you are very smart. I need you give me money. If you give me money, I will provide very good service to the senior. Uh, to the senior. That you know that Mayor Kach always make joke with me. We uh, keep smiling and talk. <laughs> and uh, I say, on that time, Mayor Kach said that, Pauline, how could I help you? City no money. I said that, Mayor, you're very smart. You don't have money, but you know a lot of a very rich businessmen and a very rich person. Why you don't ask them to donate the money? Use the money to, for the meals on wheels. 
On that time, Mayor Gatch said that Pauline, why you that smart? You are so smart. Okay, let me start to do my job. Then she, he really as the rich people and raising money. 1980, just uh, you know, three months later, we get the money. Meals on Wheels is start. Open Door is the first Meals on Wheels provider. Until right now, it's 38 years already. But I'm so happy they helped me. But I am very disappointed because last year, the OMB, thank you, the city council, you know, Margaret Chen, everyone, fight for $10,000 for the Mandel budget. <laughs> 249 senior center. 223 get the money. But open door get zero. So that's why I'm so angry. I'm so angry. I tell you, I do a great job. Without me, how could you have the Meals on Wheels program? <laughs> My gosh. But I now have the Meals, uh, Meals uh, on Wheels program. I ser definitely serve the Law Inside Manhattan and, uh, you know, and uh, uh, Law is uh, the, a lot of uh, poor area. They need the services. Mm -hmm. Why I cannot get one time? I'm so angry. Then Margaret Chen, very good, because we under he, her district. I always keep calling her. <laughs> I meet her in the district. I said that Margaret, Margaret, you are the chairperson. <laughs> Why you you mixing my center so many often? You know how we do the wonderful job. Why we cannot get any money? But they said that, oh, Pauline, because you do a wonderful job, so that's why you cannot get any money. That's fair? No. <laughs> I do a good job, so give me more money, not penalty of me. <laughs> so that's why I tell you last, way, uh, last year, I did not get any money. I get in the trouble <laughs> because, you know, and talking about reimbursement, meals on bill. They only give us Monday through Friday $7.17 per meal, including everything. But we can, we deliver seven meals a week. We can, Saturday and Sunday, only reimburse $3.92. $3.92. That's including personnel. Personnel salary, French benefits, and health insurance. My friend, mm -hmm. you know that, but nine hour minimum salary is $15 an hour, but all my kitchen staff just get the $15 an hour. Someone worked for me is 42 years, still get the $15 an hour. You think that's fair? You think that's fair? 42 years, still $15. I'm not complaining, I'm just sharing my problem. <laughs> and the French benefits, everyone said that, why we need to go to work? We want to get the Medicaid, it's better go to work. But if they go to work, the employer should concern their health insurance. You know that how much money we pay, single pay, single, we pay about $10,000 for each employee. Most of them for family plan, family plan is pay more than $20,000 a year. May I ask you, you had a very good math. <laughs> Only $3.92. How could you pay the personnel, pay the ME fee, Pay the vehicle uh, fee and pay the vehicle insurance and maintenance and food costs, everything including. I am not the super lady, I try to be. But, you know, last year, I shortage more than, more than $100,000. Mm -hmm. Thank God, 
I keep calling, calling, and push Margaret Chan. Margaret Chan said, that, "Bo Lang, I know you're so so poor. <laughs> I really want to help your poor lady because I not help you. I help you does mean help the little elderly. Later on, she gave me some money. I still short of more about forty thousand dollars." But I talked to my fund uh, sponsor agents. My sponsor agent said that the director responsibility, funding agents don't give to you, the city council don't give to you. Go ahead, door to door, and ask the people and give you the money. So that's why I tell you, I know everyone very smart, special member of the AARP because I'm one of them. <laughs> So you see, yeah. Not only that, the vehicle, really, vehicle. You know how crazy for the Chinatown and North East Side. Our our driver and meal deliver deliver meals. They had had a tag because we should door to door to deliver meals. When the vehicle park in front of the building, they come down. They get the ticket. Who pay the ticket? The budget no money to pay the ticket. The first vote they said that us the driver pay by themselves. I said that nonsense. So Pauline. that's why you know. How Can about you, parking? Pulling. You got to wrap up because you got to save oh, oh. some of the story for the budget, the real budget hearing in March. Yeah. Oh. Because I still got another panel oh, waiting. Oh. Right now, <laughs> I, I thinking I on behalf of all of you because I'm a member of the ARP. <laughs> so, <laughs> I on behalf of all of you. You give me your time to me. <laughs> And so that's why I just said that, you know, the council person, special, all of you, you know, Why I come here and raising my voice? Money, money, money. <laughs> no money cannot run the program. So that's why I sharing with you. I need the money. I need the money provide quality and quality services. I really want you to follow the Mayor Couch's way to do it. Listen to Pauline Ng's voice and give us the money. Thank you. Thank you, Pauline. Make sure you come back for the budget hearing on March 12th. <laughs> Thank you, Pauline. Uh, as a as a colleague in AARP, I'm delighted to meet you and hear you. Um, <laughs> Council um, Chairwoman Chin and Council members of of the aging. My name is Brenda Gardner. I'm yes a. Uh, Volunteer with AARP, but what I want to just really quickly tell you is a personal anecdote about food. I'm limiting it to this. Um, I am 74 years young, and I I know that, and that's one of the reasons I'm saying it. And part of it is because um, I am very independent and tend to go. Um, a lot of our older um, seniors are frail and need these programs. I, um, in 2016, had a second bout with cancer. Um, in 2006, I had the first one, did not need services. I managed when I was younger to get through it. In 2016, I had the chemotherapy and was much weakened um, in terms of just getting through the illness. And I, my independence was, all right, don't be so proud, you need help. And through Encore Services at the uh, uh, at 46th Street Center, they gave me uh, Meals on Wheels, and the volunteers who delivered daily, except for um, Sunday, were incredible. We got the meals for Sundays on, on Saturday. Um, and it's something that I... It was almost a year, I think, that I stayed with. I think I stayed with it for nine months. And then I felt I could deal with this myself again and didn't use it. But I was very frail during that time, and it really saved me. I'm just going to say it like that because it is nutrition, nutritious. Um, and so I am 
that's my personal anecdote that I really think it, it should be something that should be continued. It came out of the senior center. Um, I, I, there, since then, I, th- I think they they got delivered these meals that were sent. I mean, Fresh Direct is one now that I've heard and sometimes people say are better than the one we used. That's something that, again, it will be the cost stuff that I think it, we should definitely, I am for it. Thank you for listening to my anecdote. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you for being here. Look, look at that. Support. Yeah, look at your crowd. Okay, we have one last panel. Uh, Liu York Tim from uh, Hamilton Madison House Center. Theodora. Oh, Sionkas? Oh, okay. From also Hamilton Madison House. And Edward Ma. Uh, uh, City Hall Senior Center, Hamilton Madison House. Good afternoon. Uh, Pauline certainly hard act to follow. <laughs> um, my name is uh, Theodora Ziongas, and I'm the new assistant executive director for older adults and community services at Hamilton Madison House. Um, as you know, Hamilton Madison House was established in 1898 as a voluntary nonprofit settlement house dedicated to improving the quality of life of the um, of the uh, uh, residents in the Two Bridges community, um, Chinatown area of uh, Manhattan's Lower East Side. Uh, We speak the many languages of the community and serve more than 8,000 children and adults annually. We've been around the community for um, 120 years, continually serving the needs of our uh, residents. We want to thank the New York City Council uh, for their continuing support of our senior programs and especially the chair of the Aging Committee, uh, Margaret Chin, for being such a strong advocate for older adults. I remember the year of the senior and how great strides were achieved to increase funding for seniors and caregivers in New York City, but we still have many challenges and increased um, funding is critical to continue and expand the needs of our, uh, the services we provide. Services provided to the seniors age 60 and over in the community comprise a large part of our program offerings. In addition to the Smith and Knickerbocker and Nork programs, we operate the large City Hall Senior Center at 100 Gold Street, as well as three satellite senior centers. The meals provided at our senior centers are critical to the health and well-being of the seniors in our community. We are consistently oversubscribed uh, for both the breakfast and the lunch services, creating many challenges for us as we struggle to meet the growing needs of our community, which will only increase. Over the past five years, we have provided uh, over half a million uh, total meals, um, and we, um, which is ab- uh, close to 30,000 above what we had projected. So annually, we provide over 5% above what we are budgeted for. So we cannot continue uh, without some additional support. Health is wealth, and our goal is to provide the support, allowing our seniors to remain as active and engaged in our communities for as long as possible with as much dignity as possible. We are facing increasing challenges in achieving our goals as prices for nutritious food increase and the number of seniors seeking our services continues to increase. So it's double whammy. The cost of raw food has risen in the past few years, yet the allocation has not. The cost of paper goods and, um, instead of styrofoam is another added expense. Although we offer many health promotion, education, recreation, and other casework and health management services, the meals are the important glue that binds all of this together. 
As seniors come to our centers for our nutritious meals, they will remain for our exercise programs. They socialize and create new friendships, decrease their emotional isolation, and maintain important connections to the community. They will turn to us if they have additional needs as well since we become a trusted local resource. We cannot continue to provide the level of service we do without additional funding in the years ahead. Not only are the prices for nutritious food increasing, we are serving more individuals each year. Continu continuity is also vital as we struggle to maintain committed kitchen and custodial staff at our centers. That is really critical and we've heard a lot today about um, minimum wage. These, these individuals provide vital services and they're much more than just cooking the meals. Additional funding for cost of living increases is also essential in allowing us to do so. In our case, meeting the needs of our diverse population also requires hiring bilingual staff, which often is a challenge. And um, additional funding is vital, vital to helping us maintain this very dedicated staff. And you also mentioned volunteers play a hugely vital role in helping us meet our needs. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity to testify. I'm also accompanied today by 13 seniors from our center, which are only representative of the many thousands that we serve and show how dedicated they are to our programs. And I'm also accompanied by two seniors who would like to testify, Mr. Liu and Mr. Ma. So I'd like to introduce them. Okay, well, first? well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Well, since we don't get that much more people sitting around, <laughs> my testimony fast and quick and simple, okay? Yeah. Okay, my name is Lou York Tim. I'm a member and volunteer at Hamilton Medicine House Smith Senior Center Knock. I attend the senior center every day of the week. I enjoy helping to serve lunch and host the bingo and karaoke activities. After lunch, I encourage the seniors to participate in other activities and have fun. Okay, I believe the meal program is very important to all our seniors, not just our center, to all the senior center in New York City to help us to get our nutrition. Some of the seniors are not physically fit to cook at home for themselves, so they come to our center to have lunch. As a volunteer, I feel proud to be able to help them. I hope that there will be more funding, just kind of short, just for funding, okay? Mm. For our seniors to have good nutritious meals and stay healthy. Thanks for the attention. That's it, that's what I want to say. Right. That's okay. perfect. Thank you, thank you. There are also people watching at home. <laughs> oh wait, I want to answer one question about the red lady over there. Okay, you were have you were just telling me you have chemotherapy, right? I tell you, I was a cancer patient back in 2013. I need to have radiation and chemotherapy. I supposed to die in 2013, but I made it. My surgeon, my doctor say, nine patients out of ten they cannot survive, but I'm the last one. And this country gave me half a million dollars sitting here talking to you today. So I'm proud to be a senior and try to get more funding for our seniors. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. For the time. Thank you. Thank you. We're Mr. glad that you are healthy and strong yes. and thank volunteering you, and contributing to our community. Right. Thanks. Mr. Ma. <coughs> Seth. Uh, thank you, Honorable uh, Council Ch uh, Member uh, Chair. Uh, committee for your this today. <clears throat> I have been attending this hearing so many times, but this is the first time so touching the hidden, the ground, the, the real, real active and vigorous and the touch the point, the meal. You think the food is very, very common, you know. I'm so glad, you know, uh, Council Member Valung, you know, especially from him, I learn, I know you more better than I know you in the general community. I, I really appreciate your leadership, your quality for leadership, your really profound understanding the need of the senior. And uh, I'm so happy, I myself, and uh, as a senior, I have been 
uh, or ten years in the Hamilton Medical House since Hall Senior. Actually, I was volunteer fifty years ago, volunteer teaching Mandarin as in the. Yes, Hamilton Mental Health Senior Center. So after social work school graduate, I also I was uh, uh, doing volunteer force for Hamilton Mental House as a, uh, a community mental health advisory board chair for almost twenty years, and then become a con- human rights commissioner for six years. Now today, as a member of uh, City Hall Senior Center, and I myself I have two things to testify: the food so important because. In the beginning, we, I think many years ago, I, I got, I just talked with Dora, you know, and we got six pieces, shrimps. Now we got three. <laughs> I got three. And uh, so, so shrinking, I'm so happy. And because uh, uh, chain and uh, mentioned about the budget, so important, as I'm so happy you are trying to institute a system of Gradually, the, the, the budget increase automatically, annually, without request, annual budget increase, food increase. Who knows, you know, the budget increase. And the, the, that's why another thing, the also the, the, yeah, the, also the, now before we get shrimp uh, once a month, now we get two months, we're lucky. <laughs> when the, food, when the uh, center serving the shrimp or Salmon fish. You know what? The 450 people used to be 300. Suddenly come. I'm surprised. How did they get the word mouth to so, so come people? And I regularly, every day I go there, sometimes I couldn't get the meal ticket. So I completed to them, you know. Can you stop one minute? Yeah. I would say Margaret would tell you that because of budget cut. Yes. That's yeah. why you need to get through streaming. Yeah, yes. <laughs> and also the second one, I used to come here after a retirement. I have my wife also get more food. Uh, I eat left leftover, so I don't want to go to senior center. Now, I, after many years, I feel I have to go to se- senior center because why? For fresh food and for meeting people or getting program because getting the people. And that's why I, I feel I'm missing something. So I go to there to meet people, to get read the three papers and the senior karaoke, and I'm very happy and I feel my Retirement is the best year for my life. Thank you. Thank you. And also, uh, Mr. Ma is the karaoke champion at uh, (laughs) City Hall Senior Center. Thank you. But thank you so much for being here today. And I just wanted to uh, remind you that the budget hearing for the Committee on Aging is on March 12, uh, 10 o'clock in the morning. And the public will be able to testify um, hopefully before noon. So I encourage uh, more seniors to come and tell your story because we wanted to get it on the record and to make sure that we'll be able to fight for more funding for senior services this year. So thank you all again for being here today. Thank Thank you.